Hello, welcome to the listening. Fleming Funch, good to see you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So where where are you where are you calling in from today? It's always nice to I, see where people are. I'm in the south of France, which I have been for a number of years, mm -hmm. 17 years already. Before that I lived in the US and originally I'm from Denmark, but right now I'm happy in the countryside of southern France. That's particularly good for these confinement types of times. So you when you started off in Denmark, were you in the city then? Did you grow up in the city there? Yeah, well, I I was born in Copenhagen, which is a, a big city, but I grew up mostly in the suburbs, um, sort of a half hour from the city, so with fields and and so forth. It wasn't in the one didn't consider it into the in the country, but the, I'm used to nature. But most of the time I've lived in a more urban area. So now is the first time I've lived like where really it's right next to to fields with horses and cows and pigs walking around and that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. So I'm quite interested in your um that initial story about what took you from Denmark to America. Is that, is that uh, a story? That's, that's a story. I mean, the, well, several times I've used as a strategy in my life to make a big jump. And in a way, it's to seek adventure elsewhere, to go into the unknown and explore some other place, some other country. But also, I, I use it as sort of a I, I know if I push myself off the deep end, I'm going to swim. So there's, there's that kind of thing to it. And usually it has not been very well prepared. I've done it twice with my family. And other people would often say, oh, I wish I could do that. Or you're so lucky or you're so something. And they, they usually seem to assume I've sort of done a lot of planning and I've organized things so that now things are ready for me in another place where that's not at all what happened. It, it, it wasn't really much more than buying a ticket and leaving. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, I prepare for that kind of thing, like moving to France. We had lived in the U.S. for 18 years. My kids have, had grown up in the U.S., we were for all intents and purposes Americans. And at some point I just decided, well, it's I feel like it's time to move like back to Europe. And the rest of them thought I was crazy, particularly my kids. But my wife, since it was the second time, she sort of trusted my intuition in that. She's, oh, she's a more... You were already married with children, young children, when you first went to America then? Yeah, we were, had already been married for a couple of years. We had a, a little girl who was a year and a half. So in a way that was easier. Nobody didn't have to be discussed very much. And we didn't even there discuss it very much. We just, and I don't even remember the reason exactly. It's just like seeking adventure elsewhere. But at the same time, once you decide that, it's kind of a big deal. I mean, you need to sell things and move and decide what to do with your stuff. And it, but that follows from the decision. I mean, once you've decided we're moving to California, then you do whatever needs to be done. And it's, it's kind of a strategy I found to do in my life. I mean, if you make a big decision, I'm going to do that. Then afterwards, you just need to do whatever is involved in doing that. Now you're living in another country. Well, obviously you need to learn the language and figure out how they do things there. Like when we moved to France, we didn't really speak French. Uh, and I had totally underestimated the need for French in France, but particularly, <laughs> which sounds stupid, but in, in particularly in the south of France, they don't really speak English. I mean, some people do, but the people you need to, the bank or the 
health insurance or whatever. I mean, they don't, they're not going to want to do anything in English. So mm -hmm. we had to get up to speed really quickly. Mm. But we did. So both, both of the times we did that, we got up to speed. And that I, I love that sort of feeling of, well, that's risky out of your comfort zone kind of thing for a few years while you're trying to figure out how things are done here in your new country and just trying to just survive and have something to eat and something to do. But that it really keeps you on your toes and keeps you alive. It's also uncomfortable in various ways. But I like I like this the mental state of, of that. So what's the trigger? I mean what you know, because it must come out of somewhere this sudden decision, or is it does it just happen like you know the weather changes? And well, it's, it's, it's not it's not really an impulsive kind of thing. It's not like I suddenly make a stupid decision. So it <laughs> even though it might seem like it, but it, it's sort of something that grows. Like in the US, it was sort of feeling, okay, for some years, we've sort of been in a groove where we're comfortable here, it's fine, but it's a little boring. There's nothing really new going on. It it's, was easy to live there. We had no particular problems. But at the same time, it didn't really go anywhere. And, and after we hadn't there was a number of years where we didn't even go back to Europe but after we started going back to Europe again we started missing things and living in the San Fernando Valley in LA is sort of it's just 50 miles by 30 miles of just sort of suburb which is just a grid which is ex exactly the same everywhere there's a gas station and a McDonald's and a 7-Eleven on each corner and you drive, you still drive down to the 7-Eleven to pick up a pack of cigarettes or whatever. And uh, but it's all sort of this, the same. Whereas in most places in Europe, there's tremendous history and old houses and things have been there for hundreds or thousands of years. And I was missing some of that culture and history and connection with the with the land kind of thing. So that that sort of pulled me. And then also I thought at my, my kids, like my, my older kids at that time were teenagers. They were 16 and, and 19 and they were Americans and having sort of an American view on things, which is not bad. There are many good things about that. You're sort of entrepreneurial and individualist and, but at the same time, I, I tried to explain to them how one kind of has different values in most of Europe, like in Denmark, where we're from, where probably it's more important your friends and your family and having a good time and rather than necessarily getting a big house and a big car and succeeding kind of thing. And they, they didn't really believe me. They thought I was just full of it. And I realized I couldn't even have a good conversation about it with them because they have grown up sort of monoculturally. Mm. And so it was a big sort of risk to throw everybody into that because it wasn't just me, it was five people and it's sort of a big deal. And my older kids were just sort of ready to, to go out and work or go to university or something. And then I just sort of send us to a country where we don't speak the language and everything is <laughs> totally different. <laughs> That's maybe sort of it's, maybe it's that Viking, those Viking genes, you know, you just kind of get bored and you want to go get in a boat and just go. <laughs> Pill pillage foreign yeah, shores. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> I mean, I've done it consciously, but I guess the first time I didn't necessarily know what that would give. I didn't think a lot about it, really. <laughs> well, I like the same with... with Denmark's quite a small country and it's surrounded by the sea so you know it, it probably that's probably a big part of what made people always be moving out and looking and and exploring the world you know in and yeah. in a sort of similar way in Britain here because we're an island albeit a bit bigger there is you know you're surrounded by the sea and there's always that pull of the sea and what's over there and I think it, it must be sort of deep within the kind of memory of the the race, really, you know, or the, or the kind yeah. of the the heritage of the people that there's there's always 
going to be if you go back in your family's history there'll be a point where somebody took off and went somewhere or or you know constantly hearing about other places from people coming in as well you know so. yeah i mean I, that gets us to a whole other angle but at some point i was deeply into genealogy for some years it became sort of an obsession to research my my family which for mostly for hundreds of years back i'm mostly poor peasants who had 12 children half of them who died and they ended up in the in the poor house when the husband died and so i mean it was very sort of sad mm. but in in between of of that there were like generations where they just decided to go somewhere else like this like this sucks so so there were several uh, parts of the family that immigrated to the u.s and things like that that did go to foreign shores and usually did much better um so it's it, you're right it's it sort of feels like it's in the genes or it's in the landscape or you see the sea or you're in, on an island mm. it's, it's sort of obvious that you could or should go somewhere else and and from denmark there was sort of little barrier to that i mean also because denmark is sort of a a low context country meaning i mean you're not you're not terribly tied to your family and your traditions and your language or anything you easily s shift to a different language or go somewhere else and you feel perfectly fine and mm -hmm. you're not too worried about that you leave your old parents at home or something because there's sort of a system to take care of it so you're you you feel less attached you can easily go somewhere else and right away feel feel at home where that's a little harder for the french for example they're a little more high context mm. like lots of things depend on the the french culture and who you know and your whole life you've sort of prepared yourself for your career and and the, the place you are and the family you're from all of these things sort of mean more so french people have a harder time going somewhere else or if they do they take their culture with them they'll find some other french people they can hang out with and then they can finally breathe hmm. whereas a danish person will just sort of find the locals and start learning the language and figure yeah. out how they do things in in wherever you are so how is it for for you living amongst the french then uh, uh, how do they sort of take you and your family or how have you found that how receptive have they been or it or is it maybe perhaps quite a cosmopolitan area anyway where you are? Well, I'm I'm around Toulouse, which is a fairly well connected city. It's it's like the aerospace capital of, of Europe where they assemble Airbus planes and a lot of the the space industry and satellites is concentrated around here. And that sort of means they are they're used to people coming from other countries. It's not a big tourist destination, but there are people who move here to work. And overall, I've actually found the French to be very welcoming. Like I, part of the preparation I did do coming from the US was to read some books about the difference between American and, and French culture, or what to expect from the French, or how it is to move to France. And it was all very interesting. I mean, half of it turned out to be bullshit, but the other mm -hmm. half was was useful and like one of the things the expectations that was put up was that the french are really not very welcoming or they're like they might be rude and they don't really like foreigners but i mean i mean really it's it's just american tourists who expect everybody to do things the american way they might have some bad experiences in paris particularly yeah, that it, it yeah. sounds like that's more a sign of a strong culture where people are quite, you know, quite happy in their culture. And it's maybe a bit of a projection by the visitor, you know, it's perhaps that they're just not that interested because they're so kind of into what they're doing anyway, maybe, you know, rather well, I mean, they're happy and sort they're of happy in themselves. The it's also that, I mean, you need to know certain codes. Right. And if you, if you do them wrong, then then it doesn't work like and the codes are rather simple in France like if you meet somebody you say hello like if it, everywhere if you walk into a store you need to say bonjour before you like ask make demands on what you want kind of thing and for a French person that's like in their blood so it's so that it's really shocking for a French person if you 
just show up and ask them a question. It's like, <laughs> I don't know, I mean, we haven't been introduced. I, don't, I, yeah, I yeah. don't really know what to do. And even if it, the introduction is just bonjour, which doesn't give any information, but it's, it, it shows a certain politeness. So an American is likely to not know that. So you just walk into a store and says, uh, hey, where's the bathroom? And for a French person, that's like, even if they understand perfectly well, it's like incredibly rude and yeah. I don't know you. <laughs> Whereas if you do the simple things of saying hello or excuse me or sorry for being any trouble, but could you maybe tell me where the bathroom is? They're incredibly friendly and helpful. Uh, and I have had experiences where really French people are much more helpful or going out of their way to to help you just because you you said it the right way and you shared your story with them, uh, which is another thing in France. If you share your story, this is what's going on. This is my problem, and I'm here, and I'm with my family, and uh, this is whether my kid is a little tired, and now I'm looking for this. They're they sort of morally and logically have to help you because it's just now you now they're part of your story. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Whereas an American may would more be well. I don't have time for that. I mean, if you can't do that, you can't park here. That's not just not legal. So, <laughs> uh, but in France, you can break, break and bend the rules if if you have a good enough story and reason for it. So that that's kind of comforting. So why why Toulouse? What what was it about there in particular that that kind of pulled you in? Well, I it was a process of exclusion, really, like. I my feeling was, hey, we'll move back to Europe, but I didn't really mean moving back to Denmark. Going from from Southern California to Denmark would be really cold. Yeah, and I still consider Denmark sort of a little. I love Denmark, and I'm happy to be from there, but I still consider it sort of a little small and provincial or something. Um, I mean, there are nuances in that, but I didn't feel like moving back there. So I was thinking Southern Europe somewhere. So I just looked at the map and thought, well, it's somewhere Southern Europe with a language that would be nice to bother to learn. So I, at first I thought Switzerland, that's sort of nice, sort of in the middle in the South, and they seem to do well. And, and we can pick the French speaking part, maybe Lausanne or something. And I looked that up and that looks nice, they have a lake and they seem to have a good time. And, and back in the, at that time, it was 2002 and three. I was a big blogger. So now there's uh, Facebook and things like that. But back then, my blog would be where I would share my thoughts about things. So I just announced one day, hey, uh, we're going to move to Europe. I'm thinking Switzerland, Lausanne. Um, I didn't even particularly ask for advice or anything. I just sort of put it out there. And, but some people gave me feedback like, well, Switzerland is really nice, but it's really not very welcoming for for foreigners. It's very hard to become a citizen. It's not, unless you have a lot of money, it's not really as the place you just move to, unless you have a good reason. Why Why don't you go to France? And I, there, there, that's that's easier. And I thought, well, you know, if France is just next door. What's across the the border from Lausanne in Switzerland. Uh, we have a uh, look at the map and there's uh, Lyon. Oh, Lyon, uh, look up what's going on in Lyon. Uh, they have good food. And so I thought, oh, Lyon it is then. That sounds good. And But then I read a little more and people gave me other feedback. Like it's, it's in the industrial valley of France, the Rhone Valley, which is really rather polluted. And, and uh, so I found some of the downsides of that. And somebody said, why don't you look at southwestern France? That's there, very friendly and uh, good food. Everything is nice there. And I like, well, what's down there to lose? So, okay. And I looked at whether I knew anybody around there. And I had one person in my network who lived in Toulouse. So I, I sent him a message and said, hey, how about I come by with my wife and we just sort of check out the, the region and said, yeah, come on by and we'll have lunch. And we did that and stayed for a few days. And I looked at all the, we looked at all the towns around there. I didn't really think we were gonna end up in the city. I thought one of the outlying areas, but ultimately it was easiest to be in the city for our kids to find schools and things like that. And we really liked it, it was every, everybody was friendly, it was relaxed. And uh, so we decided, good, 
and we went back home and sort of packed up and shipped things and and moved it. It was that easy, but it's so it seems a little sort of random, but I can't really think of a better choice, even if I had to do it over again, even knowing the areas very well now, that's still the area I would choose to to live in. So, uh, so I intuitively, it, I like sort of following this kind of thing, which seems in one way reckless, but in another way, it feels quite comfortable and and safe to find something that feels right and then just going for it and enjoying the unknown parts that that show up so have you have you always had that kind of sense for things ever since you were a kid have you always kind of known no or, or sort of intuitively kind of navigated through life or situations i haven't i mean when i when i was a kid i totally didn't have it i was a very withdrawn and shy kid sort of living in my own world I would be perfectly happy not speaking with anybody the whole day and I would just sort of be in my own fantasy world and didn't really need anybody and and also I didn't really have any sort of personal uh, consciousness of, of myself. I mean I, I kind of didn't really realize that I exist before I was something like 16 or so. I, I just thought I was some kind of machine and I, I didn't realize I had <laughs> Really had any agency. I didn't think, uh, like having later having kids and realizing how much kids would like say no and be difficult and so forth. I, as a kid, it never even dawned on me that I could like refuse something. So right. I, I just sort of went along with the program. It's like it's dinner time. Well, I will eat dinner. Or well, now I should go to school. So I go to school. If you do your homework, I'll do my homework. I never thought of that. Maybe I could decide otherwise. And I was quite happy with that, but also that's sort of limiting. So it was very late that I discovered I could actually decide something. I actually myself had some feelings and desires and interests and so forth. I didn't really think of that. So it's really much later. So it's around late teens or around 20 or so where I more sort of started sort of waking up. And then through my life, there's been a var variety of of discoveries from, I came from also being more, much more intellectual that I am now more sort of thinking about things, but various experiences in my life led me to more of a feeling sort of orientation. Uh, so even though I moved to, we moved to California for that kind of reason, I didn't really, I wasn't very conscious of it at the time. It wasn't before maybe 10 years later, I really realized that this is a very, valid strategy for me to to jump into things I don't know uh, intuitively not just any stupid things but somebody I feel this is this attracts me but I'm a little bit afraid of it I probably should do that and see what happens so that became a winning strategy later where I realized each time I did that I entered a new field and you very often I ended up loving it and and around that time i also made a complete sort of reorientation to more navigate through life more sort of feeling wise intuitively rather yeah. than trying to figure things out fleming let let me just pause it a second okay we're back. so the um i mean there's various I've had a lot of experiences in my life that sort of changed my orientation by what happens, what happened. Uh, and one, one example was while we were living in, in California, more specifically in 1994, uh, there was a big earthquake in, in LA, the Northridge earthquake. And if you look at where the earthquake was on TV, like the map of here's a red dot with rings around it as the center of the earthquake. We lived in the center of the red dot of the earthquake. The, the epicenter of the earthquake was just like one block over from, from where we live. And uh, before that time, earthquakes was one thing I had been sort of obsessing a bit about, or I had been obsessing a bit about where's the right place to live? I had been looking up sort of there's, you know, what's it called? 
I mean, that's like astro geography where based on astrology, one can sort of figure out where the, which kind of places work best for different people and so forth. I've been trying to use various methods to figure out where, where should one live to be all right. And I really, so even though we didn't move at that point, I was sort of looking at, well, should we move to Northern California? Should we do something else? Uh, and, and I was particularly concerned about earthquakes or anything or something like that. So I thought, well, how could you live a place where, where you wouldn't be subject to things like that? But, but then suddenly we found ourselves in the middle of the big one in, in, in Los Angeles, which is in many ways catastrophic, but in other ways was totally miraculous. And uh, our experience was really that we were perfectly all right. And most things that happened were really uh, useful, uh, both with us and people of, around us, that the, the earth sort of shook us into out of our normal pattern and into a, a better one. So like, like just one example, in the whole San Fernando Valley, every wall made of bricks, like many houses had like bricks between the, the yards. It, every brick wall fell over uh, and some houses too, but you, you, usually one wouldn't build houses of bricks. So it would usually be just sort of a facade for looks. I mean, usually a house would be built of a more sturdy thing, but anything brick just fell over. So symbolically, it means like your your wall between you and your neighbor, it fell down. Yeah, yeah. And and the result was that like on the street we were on, we hadn't really talked much with the neighbors. I mean, in typical LA style, you just sort of drive into your house and uh, offload your groceries and watch TV or something. You you don't necessarily think about the community. But community emerged from this. Suddenly you could see all your neighbors and nobody has any electricity. It's in the morning. We, we're not really sure what happened, but obviously an earthquake. We don't know how bad it was or anything, but everybody comes out on the street and we ended up having a great barbecue in somebody's front yard where everybody, old ladies brought out their cakes and things from the freezer, which wasn't working any longer. And we were like cooking and somebody plugged a TV into a car battery and we sort of tried to figure out what the hell was, was happening. And that became the start of a neighborhood watch community thing where we had block parties <coughs> and things that's like really, that. that. That's really interesting. Cause it's, <clears throat> it's like everybody got shook out of the kind of program they were in and they remembered they were human and they had that yeah. kind of um, need for other people. So it's kind of, that's a really interesting thing to happen, isn't it? That, that it's, you know, it's, what, it's what you think, what you, what you kind of don't even realize is going on because everyone's just living their lives and maybe didn't notice that, <clears throat> excuse me, that they were, you know, that people were quite detached or, or not really knowing who was living around them. And then something like that happens and suddenly you're kind of and perhaps also reminded of what really matters in life when you're threatened in that way like you're, very much so yeah. so your your priorities would tend to change and i have some, some some even more drastic examples of that there like i i knew several people at that time who lost everything they owned meaning their house was condemned <clears throat> didn't necessarily fall down, but it, it became sort of unstable enough that they were not allowed to go back into the house. It would just be bulldozed away and they lost essentially all their belongings. And I'll give you one example of that was in the place I worked, there was one lady in the, in the accounting department that everybody sort of feared. She was like a bit of sort of a dragon, like, uh, she was like really she was usually pissed off about something and if, if she were you were on the wrong side of her you were in big trouble she was a big lady who was like gonna kick your ass somehow and she was she always seemed like pissed off or something and uh her house was destroyed uh and she in her house she had um, she had she collected porcelain figures. She had collected oh. porcelain figures in glass molds like for years. Let's say so. Her house was like a museum of everything placed exactly right, and 
and all these porcelain figures and stuff. And uh, it was bulldozed away. I mean, which seems like horrible for this is like her passion and her one passion in life. But the result was she totally transformed after that. Mm -hmm. I became good friends with her afterwards. And she was like, well, yeah, I, this was, I mean, this was destroyed, but it's just stuff. I mean, I'm fine, really. And other people I know are fine. So it really is, doesn't really matter. She totally converted into a different way of, of living. And she became more of a spiritual seeker, and meditated and did lots of things and was much more pleasant afterwards. But it took destroying her, her yeah. house. That's sort of what she needed. That's interesting, isn't it? It's that, that sometimes crisis, I mean, often that's what crisis is for in a way. It, it sort of just destroys everything that maybe isn't working or maybe isn't really who you are or what's important and yeah. forces a kind of reassessment of where you're at and what you're doing. And I think that there's probably been a lot of that going on during this pandemic as well, you know, where, where everyday life is just interrupted. And well, what looks to me like, and it's never going to be the same again. So you're, you're having to kind of look at where you're at, what you're doing, and reassess everything. And maybe you've lost your job or, you know, um, you haven't seen people for a long time or, you know, you're, you're on your own for a long time. All these things that kind of completely disrupt whatever pattern you were you were kind of living through before and it, it also sort of reveals well how well how able or how ready are you to to deal with that hmm. like if, if 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 you resist that if if you just sort of react negatively and you kind of refuse to assess what you should change then it's super uncomfortable so lots of people are having a really hard time currently and there are legitimate reasons for having a hard time i mean some jobs or some types of work are very difficult to do you're not allowed to do certain types of things but still i mean it sort of tests how how resilient are you or how ready are you to look inside and find out what what, what does that mean what how can it be different yeah, and institutions as well, and maybe even especially institutions, I'm sort of seeing a lot of the kind of foundational institutions of our culture don't seem to be handling things very well, which, I mean, to me, it's a part of a process that's been going on for a long time now anyway, which is a transition from this entire way of being to something else, which is not yet clear. But this seems to have kind of brought the focus really quite sharply of that kind of disruption. And yeah, on a personal level and on an institutional level, you know, there are those who are like embracing it and adapting and going, OK, this is an opportunity, time to do something different. And there are those who are trying to hold on to the old way, you know, even though it's pretty much impossible to, you know, we're seeing a lot of that with uh, the control as well from governments and, you know, people like that. Um, it's fascinating to watch. And I don't know how it's been in France. What, what's been the experience for you there? And, and sort of generally what you, you picked up from what's going on around you throughout well, this whole thing. Have you had a second lockdown? Yeah, you know, we're in a second yeah. lockdown. And it's not entirely successful because there are too many exceptions to it. So the numbers are not low enough to really open up for Christmas. So there's a bit of a, a decision point right now on what they're going to do next. Um, and because it's the second time and people are getting tired of it, more people are sort of rebelling and not taking it seriously or talking about like conspiracies or well, it's, it's just these masks is all a thing they do to show us that we should shut up or something. Uh, um, so there are more people who are sort of um, having a hard time dealing with it. Well, the first time it went pretty well and everybody took it really seriously and it worked. But now, I mean, we've also, because we've seen that, well, nothing that much happens or 
you might know people who have it and well it's just it's no big deal so more people are not taking it very seriously mm -hmm. they're not necessarily in contact with the, the people who work in the intensive care units and see people dying all over the place i mean for most regular people it's not a big deal but for the people that it is it's bad uh, so it's hard to to deal with I, overall i think the french authorities dealt with it perfectly well as well as they could but this kind of thing it shows the limitations of centralized authority yeah. like uh, that you really we expect somebody in the government to decide for a country of 60 million people or whatever what to do and and we see the limitations different countries that it depends on the guy i mean that is it uh, if it's Donald Trump or the guy in Brazil, I mean, if it's somebody there who just doesn't really care, then uh, I mean that that we de we depend on that really some people can just sort of decide what they think they should do. It's sort of a weird system that uh, everybody else can sort of be held prisoner to a centralized decision like that. Yeah, and they they don't seem to be the wisest or the best qualified people to make the decisions either. So it's no, a bizarre they... situation, isn't it? Where, yeah, well, what do you do? I mean, what do you, how do you kind of, how do you do that in a better way? You know, have you got any ideas about, you know, better ways of organizing, you know, in terms of even governing or, or you know, the way we, we've been doing things? Because they don't seem, to me, they don't seem to work or fit the world we live in anymore. It feels no. like the world has changed so much and we're still running a kind of industrial governmental model really yeah. in, in most of its forms. And you'd think that things like dictatorships would have sort of slowly as we progressed have died out, but they, they seem to be having a bit of a renaissance <laughs> right now. Yeah. So, there are new ones. You know, it, it, or maybe that's just an illusion from having grown up in a, you know, a fairly democratic country, at least in appearances anyway. Um, and maybe it's never been the case. And perhaps most of the world has been in sort of tyranny for most of history, I guess. Um, but yeah, what, what are your kind of thoughts around that, that sort of thing? Well, I, I have thoughts about it, but they're being challenged by a thing like the the pandemic here. Because, I mean, otherwise I would lean in the direction of, of extreme decentralization and let, pe let people figure it out themselves locally, that there shouldn't really be lots of things imposed from the top. It doesn't make sense. They don't really know everybody. They don't know what's needed in different areas. And it's not the same thing that's needed in different areas. So it's much better that locally one works it out. So some kind of local direct democracy kind of thing would be what I would be leaning towards. But at the same time, I mean, when we're talking about something, if we're really talking about a global pandemic of something that will kill potentially millions of people, at the same time, it doesn't work so well to, to just let people decide by themselves. So that puts us in a tricky bind, like, uh, uh, let if we just let people locally decide it well some people are going to decide to ignore it and have a big party and other people are going to take it seriously but uh, maybe the the possible protections against it only work if everybody more or less agree with it so it's that's tricky the same with like vaccinations if half of the population is anti-vaccination and the other half will just go and do their vaccinations as they're supposed to they're not going to be really going to work as well as they should, and then, then what? Whose fault is that? So it so it challenges a little bit my otherwise my belief that of course people should decide by themselves. There shouldn't really be things that the government should tell you what to do. You should decide how to live your life, and as if you don't hurt anybody, then that's fine. Uh, but. It's, it's an illness that's shared across the whole world. I mean, that sort of challenges that uh, in a way I don't particularly have an answer to. Um, I mean, that could still be dealt with if people were informed enough. It, 
I mean, part of what we've seen is that there are limits to democracy. I mean, just letting people decide by themselves and vote often makes them do something stupid. Um, so, I mean, people are badly informed uh, just talking amongst themselves about some really big issue, like a national issue that doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. they, they might be very well informed about what the situation in their own town, like what, do you, what are we going to do with the water and the food and so forth right here. Most people should be well equipped for that, but they're badly equipped for deciding what should the whole country do. So, uh, so that sort of shows the limitation of democracy. If we all just vote on which guy should run everything, then they're going to pick Trump and uh, Bolsonaro and whoever dictator. I mean, they're usually elected by people who think, ah, yeah, he's going to do something about it. Uh, so it, it shows that democracy doesn't, I mean, in, in some ways, dictatorship is more effective on a bigger <laughs> scale because then somebody just decides what to do. It doesn't need to check with anybody. Uh, but none of them work, of course. So, uh, yeah, but it is, is that perhaps more um, rather than it being that democracy doesn't work? Because I don't know that we actually have or have had democracy. Maybe we've right. never had democracy, actually, as I understand it. Um, we've had kind of things that look like it or that pay lip service to it. But I wonder if in actual fact they are. Um, I see a lot of evidence that there are powerful things happening in the background all the time that yeah. are not elected or, or chosen by anyone. Um, yeah. And I wonder, yeah, I wonder if it isn't more about access to information and the ability to critically think about things which is an education issue i guess so if you don't have a population who've been educated to consider things from all sides and to look into the kind of smaller details of things and the complexity of things rather than wanting very simple answers to complex questions and if you don't have a reliable source of information or a journalistic network that is protected and enabled to speak freely without any kind of um, comeback, you know, from powerful people or institutions, if you don't have that, then your population can't be informed. And then if you have people who are actively polluting the information pool and playing it and you know doing all kinds of things to to manipulate what's out there in terms of information then it becomes as we're seeing now um it becomes pretty much impossible to know what's going on with any certainty um and also because now we have social media which almost as a byproduct of a desire to make profit has created a situation where um, misinformation is spread more readily because it creates more attention and therefore more revenue. So it's kind of biased towards poisoning the information system, even if nobody decided, oh, let's do this, this is a good idea, because you know they didn't. It's just a kind of side effect from from the business model that social media companies have so all of that going on now means that we're in it's a kind of irony because we've got access to more information than we've ever had but it's so polluted and perhaps years of a sort of degrading certainly in britain and perhaps in america too and i don't know about the rest of europe or further afield but a, an education system which doesn't seem to be equipping people to think critically or to go into more detail when they're considering what's going on or, or even like how to kind of process all these different points of view and, and make some kind of intelligent guess as to what's actually going on. So if you don't have any of those things and then you're presented with a choice or you know, a choice of people to vote from. And even that choice, as we've seen in the States, there's no choice because 
all of the, the kind of interesting good people that were on the edges that you'd think, oh, they actually seem like an honorable, decent person who believes in something. The institutions that, that kind of control politics don't allow those people to get in. So, so, so you end up with a kind of no choice, which is Trump or Biden, which either way it, you're fucked, you know, <laughs> cause it ain't pretty. So yeah, I, you know, I wonder, uh, this is, to me, this is all symptoms of the same thing that this, this entire way of life and culture is in the end game. It's, it's finished. And this is what it looks like when a system is old and corrupt and no longer working. And I just wonder how, given all the technological changes and, and you know, the coming kind of biotech changes that are now looking possible, and even this whole I, um, kind of impending crisis of AI and where that will take things, you know, it's, it's just fascinating to me to see how we're going to negotiate or, or move forwards. Because I, I do think, going back to what you were saying, that some sort of decentralized collective intelligence that maybe spontaneously appears through the network to deal with problems that may be large, multinational problems, or they may be very local but is very kind of adaptive to that. And something like um, uh, a kind of reclaiming of wisdom in a very localized level, like giving local people or creating a system whereby the wisest people in a community come to the top and are given real power and real finance and resources to use that power to to kind of assign resources to different things some way of like building up from the ground that kind of thing in a local sense and then connecting all of those local um power bases and wisdom bases across a country or a region and then across the world so something yeah, I, I mean, I see that it would be something completely different and it wouldn't be the old top-down hierarchy of, you know, what we've been no. used to. I do, but of course, I do how, does that, how does that come into being from the ground up when the actual old power structures are, are grabbing all of the power? And as we've seen with something like this pandemic, which whatever it actually was and however serious it actually was or, or, or however you know, threatening it might have been, the way it's been responded to has been completely corrupted by politics and power and you know, money. So it, you know, how can we trust what we're being told or, or or the response and 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 the the taking of power I mean, as we know throughout history whenever a, an institution like a government takes power they reluctantly give it back again so so when there's a huge crisis like in the states with 9-11 all these kind of laws get passed which kind of infringe on people's civil liberties because there's you know a war on terror and we're in this dangerous crisis but of course as time goes by those powers don't get taken in again they're still there and the same thing with the pandemic so i wonder you know it's like all this control and separation it will be very they'll very reluctantly give back the power now that has been taken and this control control those institutions do not want to give back the control once they've got it because they want power that that's their nature so when they're given power they don't want to let go of it so how you know that's going to be interesting in the coming year to see if it does subside um even officially whether or not kind of life will will kind of be allowed to free up again or not you know or or will it you know this is my concern is that 
we're just another step closer to a kind of totalitarian hell. <laughs> yeah. And well, given, and given the, the power of the technology to realize that, you know, God, if you if you if you gave Stalin or Mao or Hitler or or you know whoever throughout history, if you gave them the kind of technological power for control that we have now, with everybody plugged in and on their phone and surveil surveillable whatever the word is, uh, <laughs> surveyed, <laughs> surveyed, you know, like and and voluntarily, you know, so you know where somebody is how much they're spending, what, who they're talking to, you know more, in fact, about their lives than they do through, through the data that's in Facebook and places like that. They know more about you because they know all about what your friends are doing and saying and thinking, and they know more about the, you than you ever could, in a way. And if you take that, which it is, that information, and then you give it to somebody in that position of power, they have total control and we're so close to that that terrifies me it's it's a crossroads so it can go in different directions but i mean it's it's terrifying so i i used to have faith in the approach of getting people sufficiently well informed and having the tools and learning critical thinking i mean just a few years ago i would think that would be the answer like, I mean, if you imagine that it's not just the central authority, but it's any of us who had access to all the information. Like if I had access to what the politicians, what everybody were doing, in principle, I would have supported total transparency. Like if everybody could just see what everybody would be doing, you can't really hide what you're doing. But right now it's, it's uh, asymmetrical it's, uh, and it's centralized that centralized companies or governments can see what I'm doing, but I'm not really total. I don't really know what's going on in part because not because I'm stupid. I am good with critical thinking, but it's really hard to figure out who to trust and which information is good or how do I verify things there, there's no real good approach to how do I check what the real information is? I mean, we're just getting, news articles which say something how do i know if that's true i mean i can read it might be totally made up it's a lot of trouble to go and check that and ask people so most people don't do that i might just find another article that says the same thing and i'm like yeah there you go it's true uh so my my faith used to be in that we technologically we would have better ways of getting access to the real information and we could be trained in more critical thinking uh, but since then, things have gotten really much worse so that now all kinds of bullshit will fly and without uh, and we're very easily half of the population will believe something totally ridiculous. And we argue about which half of it is. Each half will think it's the other half that has totally been misled. Uh, and there's no there's no no longer anything to refer to. There's, there's no longer a tradition of like investigatory journalism that we would trust that okay these guys have really spent several months and digging up all the data and now they present the result it's just another article uh, just one that's harder to write than somebody else's quick uh, youtube studying things and presenting their results it's hard to know what is what so i no longer think that that will answer it uh, i mean the way it's going now it's it will just keep falling apart but but my or the answer I've tended toward is more is as local as possible, but so local that it's more individual. I've more gone in the direction of the answer is for each of us to do what we really feel needs to be done. I mean, we clearly don't have the tools or the system for understanding properly what's going on in the world or making a decision on it. So maybe let's not do that. Let's concentrate on what I can understand and do, uh, which is my own drives or aspirations and how I locally, or uh, doesn't have to be only locally, but how can I get that into the world? So in a way, not no longer trying to 
sort of piece together what should the government do not not even giving it much attention whether they're doing the right thing or not but rather pull the attention away from that and get busy doing things that each of us can do and then finding ways of connecting that together so that becomes as bottom up as it can be but but very individualistic it, it took me a little while to get to that point of view because i'm very otherwise oriented towards getting the whole to work i want the collective intelligence to work but for that matter in collective intelligence has almost always been uh, small free agents that do their thing and together that adds up to something that works it has never been imposing things from the top that uh, that has that's the hierarchy is that collective intelligence is that each of us can see and act and do things independently and that we can do that in relation to each other so I'm, so my tendency is in that direction to sort of pull all energy out of uh, Brexit and Trump and, and all these things and get busy doing doing stuff creatively as locally as possible and there are barriers to that I mean there's lots of things that are difficult to do because your things are being imposed on you but still there'll be some things you can find that are that makes you tick and that turns you on and that uh, that can move mm. and the best driver is really our individual uh, desire and move and, and and vision kind of thing and uh, we're so much just sort of sitting waiting for for things either to fail or succeed uh, waiting for the end or waiting for the government to fix it or something and that's mm. that they don't they can't do that they don't they're just stupid people like us so what we can, what we can do is maybe with some work finding what well what should i be doing mm. uh, that nobody else is doing and then just do that and then tell other people about it and and keep it sort of uh, i think uh well positive in a sense that like this the idea of a duocracy i mean i do something there's no arguing with that if i'm if i am cultivating this little piece of land and i'm planting flowers there then that's what i'm that's what's there i mean nobody should come along and vote and say no we want potatoes rather than flowers i'm making flowers if you want potatoes then go and plant some over there and then that's great and then we can talk about that so so like the the power of like doing things that you feel needs to be done and then connecting that together yeah so, I, so what yeah yeah i i i think this is this this is where because there's a tremendous sense of impotence in people because they look around and everything's going to shit and they don't know what to do right it's like well, what do we do like you know and it's exactly that what you're saying i think that is how you deal with where we're at there's there's two parts to it to for me there's you start with yourself and you say okay well what can i do within me first of all how can i improve my life the way i am what can i learn that i maybe don't know or or what can i fix that's broken or how do i kind of improve myself so that i'm a better person first of all for all those immediately around me my family the people closest, friends, my community. You know, what can I do within myself to be a better person in the world and to be doing something positive in the world? And then from that position, you then do what you are doing, as you're saying, you know, you what can I be doing in the world that fulfills who I am, but is also bringing this gift to the world that I can share with the community so I can bring the gift of who I am when I'm being at my best doing the thing that I'm here to do and it may be several things it may be one thing and I'm bringing it to the community as a gift in a way you know and it's a fulfilling gift for me to give you know so everybody wins from that situation and if you start like that and you combine that with some sort of way of organizing communally to support each other and to encourage a way for wisdom to come back into decision making so because we all know everybody knows somebody in their life who they think is probably the wisest person they know that they might go to to ask about something or you know a situation comes up 
you might go and get advice from that person. They're all around people like that. And those people, you know, traditionally way back when we were tribal people, they would become the elders, you know, they would be the people that when the tribe sat down in council, everybody would listen to, you know, because their life experience had led them to a place where they had something useful to say and maybe their kind of kindness and impartiality or fairness, you know, would have been known and noticed by everyone over time. And so naturally you would defer to that person. You know, that's a very, because authority, there's nothing wrong with authority per se. It's when it's enforced, it's when it's a job title and somebody who's found a way to get in that job claims a title whether or not they have any natural authority or wisdom or any experience to actually back that up whereas when it naturally happens you know when you're around somebody wiser uh, and someone you really respect you naturally defer to them in that way and they are the authority so i think something that that nurtures that and allows that to come back into communities and then you know perhaps you could put forward the best people in a region into a council to make decisions about a bigger area and so on and then maybe you know that whole area somebody that those wise people decide is the one to go forward and represent them in a national assembly of people you know something i think something like that but it starts with with the individual because if you have a nation or a world full of sovereign individuals who are taking responsibility for themselves and doing what they can for them and the people around them, you've already got a much better situation. Yeah. Because you have a population who will just autonomously do the right thing and react in the best way. And that to me really is a collective intelligence where it spontaneously arises because it's natural. Because you know, you know, if it's working in that local way, when you put all those little local nodes together, you have an intelligent network right there. And, you know, it's much more likely that something like that can respond more efficiently and quickly and appropriately to a situation than some big clunking top-down machine that just can't make subtle decisions you know, and just has to kind of paint everything with one brush and say it's this or it's that. Yeah. And that we could get away with that, you know, in the past when the world was a smaller place with less people in it and, and a simpler place in terms of the development of the culture. But it's so complex now and the technology is so powerful and our ability to fuck things up is so much, much, much more than it ever was that these old ways of deciding things are woefully inadequate and we do need something super intelligent to deal with it and quick <laughs> because we have, yeah, we have some really, our technologies run away with us and we're not spiritually or, or kind of, socially or mentally equipped to handle the responsibility of what we've created and we need to quickly get to that place yeah so i mean it's possible that there could be technological ways of helping this i mean but one way as we're talking about is to start very locally i mean if you're sort of physically know people locally then it's hard to be fooled by false information i mean you see people in front of you mm. um but still that's that's limiting as well it would be nice if there's a way of sort of recognizing who's actually doing something like like as you said i mean the the, the algorithms of social media are mostly organized towards everything that sort of uh, creates controversy and and uh, that's because that creates ads that people can click on and it doesn't matter if it's true uh, so similar algorithms could potentially if they were organized differently amplify what actually things that actually are being done or somebody's actual 
uh, desires and initiatives rather than people's opinions about other people's opinions that they don't like. Uh, I mean, that potentially there could be a technological solution to that. There should be, it, 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 somebody's opinion about another opinion shouldn't have the same weight as your life's work. But uh, right now it does, because each of them is just sort of a few sentences. I mean, uh, in reality, they're not. Uh, one thing is just somebody's thoughts about something. The other is this is what you're doing. So there, there ought to be a way of actually recognizing and amplifying and showing the the doing the actual uh, local individual creative constructive activity uh, and down scaling all the sort of second thoughts of about what you should be doing instead kind of thing I mean, yeah that, I, that that's an interesting idea is is taking that machinery that's already been built and just giving it a different purpose so the purpose that exists now is to make profit and that's why we see what we see because whatever creates the most attention is the thing that gets amplified and it sort of self feeds it feeds back on itself and increases that but if you had something that was wired for wisdom say or for solving problems or for encouraging people or building their confidence or making it more likely that people's mental health was protected and helped and improved even, that would be a very different kind of social media, wouldn't it? So it, it that's a fascinating kind of possibility right there. If you could somehow find a way that to incentivize that, because obviously in the world we've lived in so far, profit is the great incentivizer, and that's why all of these things have happened and it's the same with corporations because corporations are destroying the earth or turning like ecosystems and people's lives into profit which is just digital numbers you know in a database if we could somehow repurpose those same corporations rather than trying to fight them which you never will succeed at you know if you could somehow just change that tiny little bit at the center which is the profit motive, if it could be like the, the well-being motive or something entirely different that served all of life, you would see this, because you could use that whole architecture and infrastructure without changing it very much, but just redirecting it, like almost changing the thought in the mind of the corporate giant, yeah. you know. Yeah. But, uh, but how, how you could do that, and sustain life because obviously we're locked into this kind of profit way of doing things in the west in this capitalist way where that's been how we did it so far but obviously it's got to a point where it's toxic now and it's actually killing us but how do we kind of how that's the challenge how to kind of change that little seed at the center of these things because that small change would have a dramatic effect. That's the place Definitely. to put the lever, isn't it? That's the point of leverage is. Yeah, and that's, that's, a, that's a legal thing. I mean, it's, I mean, it's harder to change by the mindset. I mean, we can agree that it would be better with another mindset, but really the, most corporations are doing the very best they can at optimizing things within their defined yeah. framework and their their framework is defined by what a corporation is and what it's supposed to do and how it's owned and so forth but if that was defined a little differently they could just get busy yeah optimizing towards another kind of profit it wouldn't change very much it just if the profit includes well-being and the planet and so forth then it would be different and there are corporations like that they're in various jurisdictions, there are now B corporations, which are defined like that, that they have a, a bottom line, which is not just profit for shareholders, but which is also the environment, how they get along with the local uh, economy. The, and there, there, there are various points to that, which makes it... Uh, are they, makes do, it they really, do they really work though? Can you have the profit and that, or are they just doing that because that's something it's, you know, the cynic in me would say, oh, they're doing that because that makes them, you know, more acceptable, but they're still 
driving the profit. It seems like they have to do it. It, it seems like it's structured so they can't, it's not just greenwashing. It's not just that they say it in an ad. They actually have to prove that they do certain things. And, and there are some big corporations. There's not a lot, but there are things like, uh, uh, I can't, they have the people who make boots that are sort of uh, outdoorsy. Uh, I forgot what it's called. But there, there are some, there are some well-known corporations doing it, but they're rather few. And it is of course risky in that another cutthroat corporation that doesn't yeah. have the same bottom line, they, if they just have profits, they can cut away some of these other things. They don't have to not pollute. Uh, so it's tricky to do that, but it seems like it's catching on a bit. Uh, of course, it would catch on more if government actually redefined, uh, got rid of the loopholes that allows a corporation to be sort of free of responsibility yeah. and but of course yeah the, but so that requires new government because our existing governments are so corrupted now by yeah they have no influence. thought of doing that at all yeah uh, because but they the could. ideal is that government serves the people and government regulates the corporations and the powerful institutions to keep them in line and in check and make sure that the whole of society is being served but of course in practice that you know that that stopped a long time ago because yeah. inevitably the powerful the rich have you know it's very hard not to be corrupted and and as you know as a system becomes more corrupted more and more people are attracted to it that would be corruptible and less yeah. and less kind of honorable people or the more they get pushed out and you know that that's just a life cycle of anything like that, I guess. So, uh, so it goes. Ironic ironically, what could work is that a few uh, billionaires who have succeed yeah. succeeded in the corrupt system decide that well, I actually yes. want to use my influence to make it different. That's an interesting point because it's something I was thinking about the other day. I was thinking all it takes is one or two of these massively wealthy billionaires to have some kind of spiritual breakthrough and to think fuck i'm you know i want to be somebody else now i've done that i i've got all the money and all the power that that brings what if i just do something completely different and i would say that it's more likely now than ever than ever that that that's possible and you sort of start to see the beginnings of something like that with maybe someone like elon musk and what he's been doing with tesla and you know yeah it's all making billions of dollars but it's there is a kind of drive in him to do the right thing as well i think even though he's very much kind of also looking at mars and you know fuck the earth i'm going to mars <laughs> i mean i know he doesn't he's probably not thinking that but but yeah i think there's there is that potential that's quite an exciting possibility that that somebody you know like Bezos or whatever he's called, the Amazon guy, just yeah. has a kind of breakthrough, personal breakthrough. And then imagine using all that wealth and all that machinery to do something really good in the world. That would be so powerful. And of yeah. course, as soon as one person did that, it would have a massive influence, I think, on the, all the others around. So yeah, it might like suddenly that. become the thing to do if you're a Yeah, I like that. Or, or kind of how do we how do we sort of maybe we have to kidnap all the billionaires and take them and give them psychedelics and take them on like a journey, get a load of shaman together and like like yeah. you know, work on them. Like how do we kind of change this person? But you know, with love in our hearts, like in a really yeah. well meaning way. We're not trying to harm you, we we're just trying to up your you know, but, but there are, I mean, there are moves in that direction already, although they're not fast enough, but I mean, there are, there's a group of billionaires that have decided to sort of use all their money for charity and so forth uh, in a fairly traditional way. But uh, uh, there's that, and there are more of them who are sort of like, yeah, Musk or people who are talking about uh, more by have a vision they're not just trying to make money they, they want they do what they do for for the planet in a sense and Beastus could uh, could be I mean he's uh, 
you know, he's as evil as he's made out to be. I mean, he's just sort of busy running his company. Yeah, no, he's just he's just good at, at making money, at being a businessman, yeah. and he's really good at it. And he's 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 timed it just by luck, really. I suppose with the technological age that he was working in, and he just very cleverly utilized the internet and made his money that way and you know he's just good at he's just a, a good businessman you know the best there is probably given yeah and, and he's really good at like distribution of goods and stuff i mean yeah. really amazon is much easier than most alternatives i must admit even though i'd rather support local businesses it's yeah. just not as easy as getting it expressed next morning um so, I mean, if, if he was in charge of organizing something else uh, or if, if the rules were changed a little bit, yeah. he would be just as efficient and, and productive at, at doing that. So it's like repurposing these already existent things with a different kind of idea behind them or a different motivation. If, yeah. if there was a way to plant the seed right at the heart of those things, you know, that is the mission, I guess, is to get to get that seed planted that is a completely different way of looking looking at things. But that takes a different set of values which can only come from a personal breakthrough, like a crisis, and then, you know, we need earthquakes in the souls of these people so that yeah. they can kind of realize what really matters. <laughs> yeah. But that that is, I think that that's, you know, for anyone who is a kind of activist or or is trying to change the world in some way, a more interesting question is how can I get to the heart of these existing institutions and change them in that profound way, but that small way that has an incredibly profound effect rather than fighting them, which you can never win because they're so big and they're so powerful and their mindset is what the problem is rather than what they're doing they're just their behavior is just a, a symptom of, of of the structure that's in place so how do we change that structure so where's where's the maximal leverage i exactly. mean that's, prob where's that's the probably maximum? not being on the street with a yeah uh, fighting some other people with another opinion because none of us can really do much about it but it, no. it would be yeah uh, billionaires or, or government laws banks i mean there's some places where that that could make a big difference if they just changed their approach a little bit well that and that's it isn't it and that's probably where it's going to happen you know you see something exciting like the whole blockchain bitcoin revolution where finance is being totally disrupted and it looks now like they're finally capitulating like it seems like all the big money is now moving into bitcoin because they've realized after like successive waves of first ridiculing it, then kind of, or first just ignoring it, then ridiculing it, then demonizing it, saying it was all criminals. And then, you know, trying to imitate it with their own versions, which of course were never the same thing to begin with. And now finally realizing, fuck, this thing is here to stay. And it's totally disrupting the whole of that world. You know, an equivalent of that in politics, an equivalent of that in manufacturing or, you know, or energy or all of those areas where we're kind of destroying the world and ourselves ultimately. I guess there will be the equivalent of, of what's happening with, with Bitcoin in, in, in the finance world. Because that's in potential that's um giving individuals financial sovereignty i mean at its heart the most yeah. exciting thing about that is that you take away all of that imbalance of power and you give it to the individual and also it it creates this totally trustworthy third party which has never existed before so you yeah. can, I mean, you imagine the ramifications for that in the legal system where you have this completely trustable law, you know, that could be very intelligent and updated very quickly and applicable exactly where it's needed and, and kind of 
you know, and you could have trust between parties without the need for expensive lawyers or solicitors or, yeah, so you know, those, that, for, that's a radical, radical change. So it's a room uh, for invention. Mm. Listen, I need to go to the bathroom for a moment. Let's have a short yeah, break yeah, if sure. you're okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, an interesting thought of this, let me see, I don't have the book right here. I'm, I'm reading a book by, by Peter Thiel, Thiel, I think is his name. Thiel, yeah. Thiel, I mean, he's, he's one of these billionaires and he's often vilified in the press. He was a Trump supporter. Uh, he's, however, a very intelligent man and he's, uh, it's very interesting to read his perspective, but uh, it's zero. The book Zero to One is about the, the things worth doing. I really, there's no point in doing what everybody else is doing. You want to do something that's like uh, new, different. Uh, and uh, his perspective is really very much what the world needs, in addition to how you make tons of money. Uh, and he has a rather uh, he has a uh, view of the market that I kind of agree with, with like capitalism is, is not about free markets, which everybody otherwise is saying or pretending that it's about competition. Everybody has an equal chance. And he's like, no, no, no that's bullshit. I mean, the, the way of succeeding in capitalism is to have a monopoly. I mean, the, the, the only way of really making money is that you're like the only one doing what you do. And then there's plenty of profits and, uh, and you do that by being the very best at what you do. So that's like nobody can touch you. Like Google is the best at search engine. Other people can make a search engine, but nobody's really going to touch what Google does. And and his point is not just that you're supposed to like uh, cheat and get rid of all the competitors and so forth. The point is if you do something really better, and that needs to be like 10 times better than anybody else, not just a little bit better. If, you, if you're like 10 times better than anybody else at it, uh, you deliver a quality product that really makes life easier, make things better, that gives people much more what they want, then that's worth a lot of money and you kind of deserve that kind of thing. So it's an interesting perspective where normally we would regard monopoly as being something really bad, but he means a creative monopoly yeah. like be the very best at i mean once you're david bowie it doesn't doesn't matter if somebody copies you i mean they're not going to be david bowie uh you can uh, have a david bowie concert and charge whatever you want the people who love you will be there and, and that's fine uh you're not keeping anything from anybody else so so but that thought of trying to do something that really totally will dominate i mean you, you do what you do so well that it's like there's no question about it. This is just the best of its kind. And you might have invented the category. You might have come up with some new thing. Uh, so like some successful companies do, like Apple does it. People pay way overpriced for Apple products because they're just so well designed and done. They really cared about it. Where most other companies who make computers or phones, they somehow don't really succeed in doing that, but they're much cheaper. Uh, so, so there's sort of a, uh, from an indiv individual perspective, there's the, the sort of an attitude to uh, what to do. I mean, find something that you well, the obvious, the obvious thing is you do you, you know, yeah. you, there's only one of you. So totally. if you take that thinking and start and take it to the personal level, because, you know, not everybody can invent Bitcoin or Apple computers or but what you can do. And this is what's accessible to absolutely everyone is you can do you and nobody else in the world can do you as well as you. Yeah. can. So it's yeah. the question becomes, who am I like? Really? Who am I? What is it I'm here to do? You know, what are the things that fascinate me? What are the things I'm good at? You know, what's my true calling? And this is a, a really important question. And imagine a, an education system where that's at the heart of the education system, where each child comes into that system and the whole purpose of the system is to support you and give you the resources to find out who you are, what you're good at, what your calling is, and give you all the tools you need to get you on your way. Now that would be a powerful education system. Um, totally. And that would end. That would give you a community full of people 
and a society full of people who were really being who they were, you know, doing it to the best of their ability, supported by everybody else. And the riches you would get from that for everybody would be incredible. And, you know, that's a way of, of kind of making that accessible to everybody as well, because the thing you do may not make lots of money because it may be that you're the best carer of people in the world or the best educator or the greatest artist, which could, you know, earn you money or not, you know? Yeah. So, you know, if there's a way of, you can be supported in that if you have a, a, a kind of cultural situation where everyone's supported, you know, in financial terms or in, in resources or in whatever they need to live well, then you can, you know, and that becomes a whole other question. How do you set up a system like that, that, that liberates people in that way and supports them in that way? Um, yet somehow is sustainable economically and in terms of resources and i don't know but it, it that's a great i do see that or i i kind of take that from it because you yeah. know not everyone can create a business that makes billions of dollars because it just the world just can't support that either you know we don't we don't need that and also that's no, not no. i mean things are not naturally distributed that way most people do relatively small things and that's fine but once in a while somebody will be elon musk who's doing it he's doing his thing but it's a world scale yeah, it's a, on thing a big and that's great uh so for me that's most of the 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 highest amount of leverage I can sort of think of, or what I personally relate to, at least, uh, of, of helping people yeah, do them well, which doesn't have to be a money thing. It might just be, I am just the kindest person around, or I'm the person who everybody comes and asks health advice from, or whatever, or relationship advice. I mean, it would just be the best uh, around for, for what you do uh, and to find that. I mean, we are so not used to to looking for that. We're so used to just trying to, education just teaches us to sort of fit in and uh, there's nothing that particularly supports it very much. If, if we're too different, we're like ridiculed or uh, uh, we don't really fit in anywhere. So if it's that, there could be a system or a support system at least or, or a social network system systems that support that and amplify that now somebody found that they were who they are and now they're like uh planting trees and that's great um mm -hmm. um so i mean that, that if that could spread enough i mean if enough people did that i i firmly believe that that would be an answer to all of it like if we each were yeah. sort of activated to do our thing well there, there was so big yeah, that's so because when you are in that place where you're fulfilled and you're expressing your innermost nature in the world and it's being accepted and supported by your community, you're so you you get so much personal power from that, which you can then give that energy back to the community quite willingly. Because if you ever meet someone who's really doing their thing in life and satisfied they're always giving more than they're taking in terms of inspiration or generosity or support or love or whatever it is there there's a, a tremendous sense of generation of energy from a person like that and just being around them is good for you because you yeah. pick up on some of that energy you know that's in you or you get to see oh yeah you get to recognize that bit of yourself that wants to be that as well so yeah. i i really believe that that if you somehow create the circumstances that enable people to do that they will blossom and that will have a massive knock-on effect and any yeah. problems that arise when you have a community full of people like that there aren't any problems because they get dealt with straight away and nobody yeah. needs to be told what to do because they're already, they know what to do and they know who's the best person yeah. to take it on. And they're not kind of insecure or worried that if they don't do it, what will people think? They'll just do what they know they can yeah. do because they have that self-confidence, which comes from doing the thing in the world that you're good at, that you love to do. 
and being loved for it. And it's that, isn't it? You know, these are kind of like building blocks. And you, you have know, the extra energy at extremes for extremes in a way. We're looking at the individual and you know, we're looking at things like corporations, but they're they're very simple initiatory things that could happen that could have this massive effect, like a nuclear reaction, you know. Mm -hmm. If you change something small in a person, like well, it's not small, it's small or it's it's fairly it's relatively simple. You know, if you if you find a way to access who you deeply truly are and find a way to put that into the world and make a living you you just blossom you know so if yeah. we can if if individuals who've already done that can then support and help and and find ways to enable other people to access that or even create educational systems or community support networks that encourage and support that kind of realization yeah. in people. So if, if that can be made more visible or shared more, and, and I'm sort of struck by how it, it again ties back to Peter Thiel's thing, even though that's about business and we're talking about like personal uh, who you are, but there, actually there are some key points he mentioned that if you're stuck in competition mode, prices go down in a, in a market where you're just a commodity, you're doing it, you're an accountant like everybody else, then companies will pay as little as possible for you being an accountant and you're struggling. So you spend your time struggling and working hard just to compete with all the other, the other people doing the same thing. However, if you're in like a monopoly situation or you're the best or you're best at being you, then there's no, uh, you don't, there's not this like low, if the cost doesn't go down, you, you, not that you have to jack up the prices of what you do. It's just you're, there's more abundance. You do what you do, and there's plenty yeah. of it. So you it's don't not, have to it's like. It's not a race out. to the bottom, which the other right. race. And in a way, that's what we're seeing in the world is that's what happens when it's done on a global scale with corporations where they're constantly, you know, seeking to increase their profit, therefore cutting away the waste competing you know so what happens is your everything gets undermined by that you know it 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 it's it is a race to the bottom really um, yeah whereas what you're talking about has this kind of amplifying effect of goodness you know and yeah so so if there's a way of sort of detecting amplifying sharing that or making it more visible that i mean you're being you there's no competition there shouldn't be competition i mean uh if it, if I want what you have, or I just want to be in the presence of it, I, there shouldn't be a point of getting it cheaper in China or something. I mean, that's not, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is obvious with like between and people, but uh, we're so used to one thing is as good as another. So let's get the cheapest. Uh, one opinion is as good as another. One article is as good as another. So let's just get the most also, exciting it, one. Also, it's this holistic wealth that's generated. It's not just one metric like money or profit. You know, whereas in a corporation, the only metric is profit. Whereas with what we're talking about, wealth is this, you know, you get so much. Yeah, you might make money from your thing, but the satisfaction you get, the respect you get, all of those things are immensely um, enriching. That's kind of wealth in its true sense for me is a multifaceted thing. And money is only one aspect of that. Yeah. There are many yeah. aspects of what makes up wealth. Um, you know, wealth is living in a beautiful, thriving ecosystem where you're harmoniously living with the environment you live in. And it's beautiful and it's just blossoming all the time and feeding you and enriching your life. And that's wealth, you know, not yeah. just extracting all the useful, totally. you know, resources from it and turning them into something else so that you can make some money. So, yeah, I, I mean, I really see that. That's quite an interesting way to look at it. And I think, and also it's empowering because any individual person can pursue that in themselves like yeah. now with no resources or totally. you know, whatever you've got to have your basic needs met obviously if you're just struggling for survival it, it's hard to work on your personal development it, it but if you've got better any with, space if yeah. you're in any 
place that's beyond just basic survival, there's room for you to do that. And the more you attend to that, the greater what will come in anyway. I mean, this is something, you know, we're seeing a lot of this sort of culturally spreading and have been for years now with, with the whole kind of universe of personal development and self-improvement and, you know, all this accessing of, of Eastern culture and traditions like yoga and, you know, even martial arts and things like that. They're all, cause they all feed, you know, they all feed this kind of wellness of yourself, like you're dancing. You know, I know you're, you're, you're quite a keen dancer as well, aren't you? You know, that, that those things create wealth those things that expression of who you are and and moving in that way and what that does for your physical well-being and your emotional well-being that's all kind of feeding this thing in yourself that makes you you and more you and there's really there's really no i mean one can start right now as as you're saying and and also there's kind of no real excuse for it i mean a, a barrier right now is is a lot of people are currently sort of stuck a little bit in in reacting to the world which is not in a good state so sort of sitting personally processing all the bad in the world and that kind of keeps you from doing that i mean that it's good to be empathic and and to pay attention but Really, there's kind of no reason to not personally uh, start doing your thing right now. I mean, this, I mean, as as long as you're not altogether like starving, as long as you have some kind of place to live and some kind of little bit of free time somewhere, uh, you've got what you need. There's no real reason or excuse other than that we're not used to it and we might need some encouragement or somebody might help us a little bit, but uh, there's no real reason we shouldn't do that. And I think that shift in that we don't have to wait for the world to be all right before we personally, individually can flourish and do our thing. We can, we can, can do it right now. And that would change it. I mean, yeah. just that, that shift will, mm-hmm. that then it starts happening from the bottom up. Um, but a lot of us are not doing that. A lot of us are sort of sitting sort of uh, frozen from, uh panic on what's going yeah. on in the world or, well, it, you know that's, that's one of the good things all, also about this global network is that there is the information out there and people are able now to access you know inspirational figures and it's easy to kind of be exposed to techniques methods processes that help with this process you're talking about and it's a lot harder I think to avoid having a bit of self-knowledge if you're engaging in this whole kind of information sphere that exists now, it's harder yeah, to, uh, but it is a trap. The one that you described so well, it is a trap that you can kind of get so consumed with how messed up the world is, which is really just a way of avoiding having to deal with your own mess. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, that's why we all do it. We all, I think somebody a while back, I saw a post somewhere. I can't remember the the words exactly, but it was something along the lines of, you know, if you're trying to save the world, you need to save yourself first. Or there's nothing worse than somebody trying to save the world who hasn't actually sorted themselves out. There's a, it's exactly. A, I mean, you're not really, there's no real virtue. In you're not, you're really no, really there's no virtue the at all because you're not actually doing the basic thing, which is sort out your own shit. And then we'll talk about whether you can do yeah. anything in the world. Cause that yeah. really is where the work is, isn't it? You know, take a so. mess and your impact every day with everybody you meet, that's creating the world. You are, a participant in this kind of shared creation yeah. of reality and then and really the real power is not is the real power is if you can do that despite all the reasons to the country despite that everything around you is messed up if you can like uh just move a little bit in the direction of a constructive direction of you do it, taking responsibility for your thing uh and and just moving the lever a little bit uh i mean that takes much more 
power when nobody agrees with you, but that's where the real the real lever is. I mean, if, if enough people can sort of get that get that spark and and doing it despite despite that everything is fucked up. I mean, it's it's yeah, it's a mess. It's hard to solve. I would like to help solve it, but if I can't, I can at least do me a little better or a lot better. You know that it's the classic hero story, isn't it? Really, you know, it's like the um, the little old hobbits leaving the Shire to go on that journey. You, you, the the odds are ridiculously against you, but just by taking those steps, suddenly all these people appear to help you, and you know, it all this kind of unexpected stuff happens, and what you thought was impossible suddenly seems a little less impossible as you progress. And it's, it, it is, everybody has that journey to go on within their own lives. And it's, it is, it is the reason you're here in a way as well, I believe it's kind of, and, it, and it's the most exciting thing to do, you know, and it's a never ending journey too. It's, it's, there's always further to go on that, on that path, it seems to me. But it, it is, it's the most exciting and fulfilling thing you can do. Because we all have a gift to bring, you know, we're all born as a gift. Um, and that gift, that's where the real satisfaction or the kind of fulfillment that we're all seeking comes from, is from, from giving that gift, from realizing what it is and then working at sharing it and doing, you know, doing everything you can to get it out there. And those are, you know, that's how we change the world for the better. And most people want that really, I think. I mean, that's, yeah. that's kind of my belief or my feeling. I think, my so, I think so too. And, I, and the, I've also noticed with myself, the, hold on a second. <laughs> Somebody's being spanked in the background. <laughs> People are busy in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I've, I've noticed for myself, probably the most satisfactory thing I've done in my life or, or in any kind of work with other people have been just this helping somebody sort of find their thing or that, that, that kind of moment when somebody lights up and realizes, ah, I actually have something or this is more me or I can actually take a step I mean, it might be a very small step but there's tremendous power and just a small step of somebody realizing despite anything else I can now do one thing towards my dream whatever it is or just being more in touch with that I mean it's very satisfying to to see that and I really believe there's a lot of leverage in more people just sort of changing their orientation from just reacting to everything to no i'm this is this is my this is me this is my thing i'm gonna gonna start doing that um and, then, and you need some kind of support from for mm. that it, it's hard to do alone if nobody agrees with you if everybody else agrees that there's no chance but it helps having some kind of support network or other people who are to some degree activated or doing their thing or or showing that it can work showing that they maybe are successful by having started their little thing as an artist or a business or whatever it doesn't matter what it is uh, it doesn't have to be money but it's like uh, doing your thing and seeing that you end up having having left a, a mark and in, in these at least a small way uh, so that's what i want to find or join ways of, of sharing or highlighting or amplifying preferably uh, or just doing even if there's no system that amplifies it just doing it by yourself like mm. uh, starting from your own inner force uh, doing it that would that's going to make a difference even if nobody else seems to care at first uh, I think it necessarily will be a bit contagious. I mean, uh, yeah. If, some, if somebody sees you being able to be more you, and that's good, then um, 
it should light some kind of spark in even the most uh, dim uh, person or who otherwise is stuck in, in their own lives. Well, it's magnetic, isn't it? That's why we we do have kind of heroes and, you know, there are these archetypal um, forms that we're attracted to and we see it in people. And really what we're seeing is that part of ourselves that's yet to be kind of birthed or, you know, the thing that you love about a certain well-known person is probably a part of yourself that's like knocking, saying, I want some expression, you know, and just in the same way that we're, you know, people who repulse us or they're also kind of pointing to parts of ourselves that we haven't integrated in some way. Yeah. Um, so it is, and there's so much information out there and there's so much help actually. And, and just by deciding that you're going to do it, you know, often if you're open to it and you're willing to even ask for help to just, just generally, not even specifically to somebody, even just walk outside the door and ask the world if it will help you on this. It's amazing what that can do, you know, as a kind of catalyst. And as soon as you start looking, there's so many people out there now through the internet, you can find anybody who's done what you're looking to do and has something to say about it um, that may be useful. You know, and they're, sure, there are loads of traps and there are loads of charlatans and gurus and, you know, there's a whole minefield to get through, but there's, there's plenty of good stuff out there to help with it. And that, to me, is very encouraging because... Yeah, you know, it's, also, it's asking ago, the right place, which yeah. is tricky. I mean, you can, if you just ask it out in the air, like on Facebook, well, somebody might tell you, well, that's stupid or you shouldn't do that or no, you should do this instead kind of thing. Uh, so I, there are also ways of being discouraged very easily. But uh, yeah. uh, if you know or you're helped finding the right kind of people, of course, there's somebody who has a hint for you or resource or something. Yeah, it's worth noting that there will always be people who say, you can't do that. That's never going to work. You know, and there are parts of ourselves that are like that as well. Um, they're the ones to just ignore. <laughs> yes. Just, you know. Find out for yourself. That's the thing, isn't it? You can't, you can't let anyone else decide whether you can or can't do something. It's all right to fuck it up and get it wrong as well. Better to have tried um, because it will inevitably lead to something else or some knowledge or, you know, even if it doesn't quite go to plan. There's a lot to be said for just the courage to kind of start and see, see what happens. Yeah. And we're all, I feel like everyone has such potential and it's, it is the most exciting and attractive thing to see somebody begin a journey like that or, or start to become who they really are. We're, I've, I've always been attracted to people like that and I think everybody is because they recognize in some deep way that that's right. You know, and if you put somebody like that alongside somebody who is doing a lot of talking and claiming authority like a politician there's no comparison one person is this life force and this sparkling kind of attractive magnetic thing and the other just you know you could see all that they are or all that they're not being rather you know by the comparison we all know it we all know it intuitively when yeah. we see it and therefore we have it within us. If we can recognize it in somebody else, it means it's in you. You know, if you can see that in somebody else and think, God, I wish I could do that. That means it's already in you. That's the first step to realizing it is noticing it in somebody else. Mm -hmm. So yeah, great. <laughs> there you have it. There's a plan. <laughs> There's a plan. Cool. Well, maybe that's a good point to... Uh... Yeah, I think that's good to wind it down we sort of we got in we got there in the end <laughs> or we got somewhere we went That's somewhere i think yeah yeah we went we went on a nice journey um okay well fleming thank you very much great to see you Been maybe a pleasure. Uh, maybe we'll do this again sometime as well yes i i hope so it's uh it's fruitful and hopefully interesting and inspiring to somebody else as well if they 
follow watching listening through it great all right take care see you soon bye bye